I'm going to start with just a refresher of Filecoin storage, uh, and then we will get to Filecoin virtual machine. Uh, and this is just to introduce maybe some of the audience members who are a little new to Filecoin about how it, how it works. So uh, there's a number of technologies involved. Uh, the first is content addressing. The second is something called interplanetary linked data. Uh, we'll mention IPFS momentarily. Um, and then there's Filecoin that sits on top of all of this. Uh, but to start with the content addressing, uh, I actually like to talk about the internet first. So who here is familiar with their IP addresses? Everyone should raise their hand. Uh, yeah. So your IP address is actually a geographic location. Um, and so to actually retrieve data on the internet, it's actually quite uh, inefficient and there's a range of other issues. For example, links are kind of broken. Uh, if you think of a link like a website like puppies.com forward slash beagle.jpg, you would expect there to be a photo of a dog there, but actually it could very easily be a cat. Uh, and thousands of these websites could host the same photo. Uh, so our answer to this is something called content addressing, taking its inspiration from something like the ISBN system for books. Uh, in the ISBN system, you have a unique identifier for every book that's ever been published, and that identifier actually tells you something about the book, uh, its genre, et cetera, et cetera. And so when data or any file is uploaded to Filecoin or IPFS, uh, it actually goes through a hashing algorithm that computes a unique identifier that we call a content address, a CID. What's interesting about these CIDs is if you upload the same file, you get the same exact CID. If you make even the slightest change to that file and run it through the hashing algorithm again, you actually have a change in the content address uh, that is produced. So one of the inner crimes happening in these places, and then they, they have this process where uh, they have some type of cryptography going on that shows evidence of the time and place that they took the photo, and then they immediately upload it uh, to Filecoin. Um, and the reason for that is those photos are then content addressed, and they know in perpetuity that no one has tampered with that evidence. And so when they go and they submit a dossier to the International Criminal Court, as they did actually two months ago uh, with a case for Ukraine, um, the court can be assured that the data is legitimate and no one has tampered with it. Uh, yeah, okay. Now, you might say, okay, Robert, that's interesting. You just have a bunch of uh, photos that are, or files that are uploaded. Uh, they have this unique identifier and they're just floating around uh, the, the you know, the net, or, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, uh, what then? How do you organize this data? Uh, she might say, okay, Robert, that's very interesting. You have all these files all over, uh, all over the place, and they're uniquely identified. Uh, how then can we understand uh, how these files are organized? And just as you might have a folder of pictures on your computer, that have some cats and some fish subfolders where you have your, maybe all your photos of cats and all your photos of fish. Um, we do something similar on uh, Filecoin, except uh, we use some graph theory. So who here what, did computer science? Who's familiar with graph theory? Okay, uh, cool. So in computer science, uh, let's say you're an undergrad, you'll take uh, your second semester or freshman year, mathematical foundations of computer science, and you'll spend a whole two weeks on graph theory. And then you will uh, 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 you know, be very miserable doing the assignments and then uh, trying to figure the questions out on the exams. But in graph theory, you have two different types of elements. The first is a node. So in this case, a node can represent anything. In this case, it represents a folder or a file. And then you have edges, which connect nodes together and represent those relationships between the nodes. In the case of Filecoin, uh, 
the graph that represents the data added to Filecoin is something we call a directed acyclic graph. Why, is, why do we call this a directed acyclic graph? Well, it's directed because our edges have direction. Uh, when you visualize this, it's literally an arrow between nodes, but that shows you the relationship between two nodes. For example, uh, we have cat's node and an edge directed towards this, uh, this uh, tabby photo. That tells us that this tabby photo is in the folder called cats. And we also say it's acyclic. Why is it acyclic? Well, in graph theory, if you can go from one node to another and then back up to the other node, that is called a cyclic graph. You have a cycle. You could go around and around and around as much as you want. Uh, graphs need to be acyclic uh, to show this re relationship because think about it. Let's say you have the cats uh, folder that's in the pics folder and then you have an edge also drawn from cats to pics. You're also saying that the pics folder is in the cats folder and that would make absolutely no sense. So this is a directed acyclic graph and it actually gives us some very compelling uh, features uh, for example, these DAGs are recursive, so you could traverse them over and over again with the software that you write. Uh, you don't need to recover or retrieve the whole DAG to get specific information in the DAG. Um, by the way, uh, every, every edge is also a CID, uh, so everything is represented by a content address in the, in the DAG. And you get this uh, very interesting situation because this is a data structure that represents all of the data on Filecoin, you can more efficiently organize the representation of this data. This is one of my favorite examples uh, and it's actually a word I can't really pronounce. Deduplication, okay I can pronounce it. Uh, but you can see this, let's just say it's a file, is in both this folder and this folder instead of having the file represented twice in two separate folders, you just have the two folders pointing to the same representation of the file. So this makes it much more efficient to go through that data. Um, it's important for me to note IPFS at this time. Uh, so IPFS is compliant to everything we just talked about. Uh, content addressing, interplanetary link data. This is a hypermedia protocol that lets you uh, share data, but we're going to talk a little bit later about the difference between IPFS and Filecoin. This brings me to Filecoin, by the way. Uh, so in, a, in Filecoin, and usually, by the way, uh, this is taken from my other talk, so usually there's some context about proof of work and proof of stake, but we'll just skip all that and talk about exactly what is a Filecoin storage deal. So let's see if I have a laser. Oh, oh that's, okay. That's very interesting. Can you guys see the laser? Wow, okay. Uh, <laughs> very interesting. We may have just damaged the little LEDs that are in there. Yeah, so, uh, okay, cool. Uh, I'll come on this side. Uh, all right, so the anatomy of a Filecoin storage deal. So first of all, what is the point of Filecoin? All of the data on Filecoin is compliant to this content address interplanetary linked data situation but Filecoin actually as a blockchain is the storage and retrieval marketplace for that data. So the idea here is you have people we call clients who have data they want to store meeting storage providers, many of whom you've met yesterday uh, here in Korea, uh, but meeting storage providers at the marketplace to come to an agreement about how to store, uh, come to an agreement as to the price and the duration for which they would want to store data with that data center. So the way this works uh, and why the blockchain is so important is the blockchain gives us the cryptographic uh, guarantees that the data is actually stored where and when uh, the storage providers are promising. So how does a Filecoin storage deal work? First of all, a client, someone with data they, that they want to store, that made no sense uh, grammatically. A client who has data, they want to store this data with a storage provider. They come to Filecoin and they say, hey, I have this much data. 
I want to store it for this length of time, I want to pay this much Filecoin. That is called a storage deal. And they will propose this. First of all, when they propose this, their data gets converted into the Filecoin data type uh, that's compliant to everything we just talked about. And they will propose this. The storage providers will then look at the deal and say, hey, that's very interesting to me financially. I, maybe one of them is willing to take that deal. So in order to signal that they are taking the deal, they do something called proof of replication. This is a type of proof of stake that uh, more or less allows them to show that, hey, we have made a copy of your data on uh, our data center. And once this deal uh, and the proof of replication is published to the blockchain, uh, that is the signal of the start of an actual arrangement between the client and the storage provider. Step three is, uh, well, here's a question you might ask. Okay, Robert, uh, why would a client pay all their Filecoin up front for a certain time uh, duration deal? How do they have a guarantee that they're actually going to keep the data there for that long? And the answer is they don't pay people up front. Uh, the client doesn't pay the storage provider up front. Uh, the client will actually pay over time. Uh, and they will only pay when they are given what is called a proof of space time by the storage provider. So this proof of space time is another cryptographic proof that the uh, storage provider presents to the client saying, hey, uh, I have your data in the literal memory space in my data center at this period of time, you can continue to pay me Filecoin. If the storage provider fails to provide this proof of, uh, this proof of space time, they suffer from something called slashing. So this was mentioned by Juan yesterday, uh, uh, but uh, in his Phil Plus discussion as to how we can ensure notaries are well behaved, but slashing on a uh, file point for storage writers is if they fail to show a proof of space time, they actually have file coin deducted from their wallet. Uh, so you get heavily penalized if you do not uh, act as good stewards for the data that the client stores. And then finally, step four, uh, you'll notice I mentioned that these deals are time limited. We'll come back to that idea in a moment. Uh, but towards the end of the deal, a client either needs to decide, hey, do we renew this deal with this storage provider or do we, um, do we uh, find a new storage provider and store this data somewhere else? Maybe it's cheaper, maybe they have more trust with that storage provider, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that is the anatomy of a Filecoin storage deal. Now, uh, okay, we'll skip that. Huh? What is going on here? Oh, you know what? This is a video, but I think we're in the interest of time, we will skip it. Okay. So now we have a number of uh, interesting things that we've built on top of uh, Filecoin. Uh, what I'm going to tell you about is Filecoin virtual machine, but there are other very interesting stuff going on. For example, Phil Plus, which are notaries that ensure that the data being added to Filecoin is useful. Now, useful means a lot of different things to a lot of people, um, but you can, Juan is going to come back today and talk about Phil Plus. I encourage you to go to that. Uh, I think it'll be maybe a group session up here. Um, uh, we also have what was called Bacalao, is now called Lilypad. Uh, this is compute over data. So this is actual compute jobs being done on the data being stored on Filecoin. Uh, so you could imagine doing uh, AI uh, type of stuff, uh, AI ML jobs uh, with that. Uh, FBM is on-chain programmability for Filecoin. So uh, you could think about it also as compute, but we're doing compute on the metadata of the Filecoin storage deal. So for example, uh, and this is actually probably one of the biggest uh, things to clarify, Bacalao, now called Lilypad, is compute on the data that's actually stored in the data centers. Uh, Filecoin virtual machine, it's still, there's computing going on, but we're dealing with programmability of the uh, data, or the metadata of the storage deals. So for example, the uh, time the deal happened, or the, uh, you know, who the storage providers are, et cetera, et cetera. 
We'll get to that a little later again. All right, Filecoin master plan. Step one, build the world's largest decentralized storage network. Uh, we basically accomplished this. I believe that the latest figure is the amount of data stored on Filecoin is equal to 2% of the global cloud storage uh, data, which is really, really uh, compelling. Step two, onboard, the safeguard, onboard and safeguard humanity's most important data. This is an ongoing uh, process, and we have a lot of uh, very interesting um, institutional clients, uh, such as Internet Archive, uh, New York City government, uh, Harvard libraries, uh, that have stored their archives uh, on Filecoin. And step three, bring compute to the data to, sorry, bring compute to the data to enable web scale apps. So that is what Filecoin Virtual Machine helps accomplish. So the FEM delivers on-chain programmability to the Filecoin network. And this is what the FEM stack more or less looks like. And what's very interesting about this uh, diagram is that FEM is actually kind of in this bottom layer that is the Filecoin node. Why do we say that? Well, first of all, if you're a storage provider, any storage providers here right now? Okay. Oh, okay, perfect. Uh, so you're probably running uh, Lotus. Yes. yes. Uh, so if you're running Lotus, you're actually also running FEM. So FEM is built right into Lotus. Uh, so usually I guess we would call this something like, FEM would usually be a layer one, uh, but my colleague Zach Ayesh from FEM DevRel actually likes to call FEM layer 0.5 because it's actually being run with the uh, Filecoin node. So if you're already running Lotus, you're already running uh, FVM. I'll go back for a minute. Uh, something that's really interesting as well is you can have native Wasm actors. Actors are what we call smart contracts on FVM. Uh, and these can be user defined, uh, which we really are looking forward to what uh, the developer community ends up building uh, with respect to uh, user-defined Wasm actors. Why is that? We think they'll be much more uh, efficient in terms of actually, uh, they'll be much more efficient because they're actually going to be native to FEM. Right now we are running uh, what's effectively a virtualized machine on top of FEM and it's an Ethereum virtual machine. So uh, basically people are building on Filecoin Ethereum virtual machine and the reason for this is so much of the tooling built for Ethereum uh, is what the developers are used to. And so this makes it really easy for them to develop on FVM. Uh, for example, who here is familiar with MetaMask? Okay, so right out of the box, uh, MetaMask works with uh, FVM. Uh, we also have Filecoin Solidity Libraries, um, uh, which is now in the Filecoin project uh, uh, GitHub that allows our developers to write in Solidity these smart contracts, but uh, you can write smart contracts on FEM in any language that compiles to WebAssembly, Wasm. Okay, let me just see if there's anything else I need to mention on this slide. Uh, oh, I see. Uh, I should probably mention that there's a lot of interesting uh, projects coming up that we think uh, are really compelling. Uh, one of the things Juan mentioned yesterday, interplanetary consensus subnets. Uh, we think that this will bring scalability to Filecoin and FEM enables uh, these types of IPC subnets. Um, and then renewal as a service. So uh, I'll talk about this again later, uh, but Filecoin deals are time limited. You might have a service provider that monitors the blockchain uh, maybe as a client you'd subscribe to the service provider, but they'll monitor the blockchain to see when these deals end up expiring and will act to renew those deals automatically uh, for you. Okay, uh, this is the, uh, the, the layering. Uh, something I do want to mention, there's a lot of talk oftentimes, uh, you know, whenever you talk about Filecoin, you talk about IPFS. They are actually two separate networks. And what Filecoin delivers is something of, uh, I don't want to say guaranteed, but some more uh, assurances that your data will be there over time. 
That comes from the uh, storage marketplace uh, concept. You're actually paying to make sure that your data stays there. That does not exist on IPFS. So you'll see this is what an IPFS, uh, uh, you know, this is what the IPFS stack kind of looks like. You could run your own nodes. You could run nodes with the community. Maybe you will uh, pay for a pinning service like Pinata. But long story short, uh, there's no guarantee your data will stay there. But with Filecoin, because uh, the blockchain access that marketplace, you have some more of a assurance that your deal will be there in uh, perpetuity. And then FVM uh, will uh, more or less enable a number of different use cases on top of the Filecoin blockchain because you can do custom logic around the storage deal creation and retrieval. And FVM actually sits right in the blockchain layer. Uh, we will have like kind of these layer two apps as people build on F FVM like Collective Deal. Okay, cool. Uh, and I already talked about this uh, because it's EVM compatible. It's compatible with a lot of uh, tools that people are used to. Hard hat comes to, to mind, uh, Foundry, uh, that's a, uh, an example of Solidity, which we, we will get to. Okay, now, you might say, Robert, there are so many EVM chains, why would we build on Filecoin? Uh, I think it's a common question from developers, and the answer is, Filecoin is the only blockchain that actually gives you storage uh, uh, with, their, with their applications. This is a picture of a storage container unit. Okay. Um, this, is the, this is from Phil Fox. This is a block explorer. This is the deal list. Another misconception. So the first misconception we discussed was where does FVM sit in the, in the stack? Another uh, misconception I'd like to uh, just bring about is what is a storage deal actually? Most people, like if I were to just say storage deal, they think, oh, uh, the actual data that is stored on with these storage providers. This is not true. When we say storage deal, what we're actually talking about is all of the metadata that describes that deal. We're not talking about the actual data being stored. And so you can see here you have all of this metadata. This shows all the recent deals. I just pulled this picture today. Uh, I don't know if some of the storage providers recognize their own uh, identifier here, but uh, that'd be really cool if they did. Maybe not. Uh, but, uh, or maybe we have a client in the room that recognizes their deal. I don't know. Um, but you could see we have a number of different information. Uh, you have the deal ID, the time it was created, the client identifier, the provider identifier, the piece size, uh, whether or not it's a verified deal. So piece size. Um, do I get into this or not? Okay. Uh, something that was discussed yesterday by Juan is that uh, the fundamental unit of data on Filecoin is 32 gigabytes or 64 gigabytes. Uh, and this is actually, uh, uh, how do I say this politically correct? This is a constraint for developers. I think that's a good way to put it uh, because developers oftentimes want to do deals that are much smaller. But for a storage provider, storage providers, they want to make sure uh, the sector of 32 gigabytes or 64 gigabytes is filled because if a developer only wants to store, let's say, 3 gigabytes, it's going to fill a sector and the developer is only going to pay for the 3 gigabytes, but then the storage provider has the extra 29 gigabytes that's just sitting there uh, you know, that they can't fill. So we'll talk about aggregation soon. Um, uh, and how developers can actually aggregate their deals with other developer deals or other deals generally to fill a sector before it's actually added or accepted by a storage provider. And then verified deal, this is the fill plus situation. 97% uh, of all deals are now fill plus verified. These are notaries that will make sure the data is useful. Um, the reason for that is the storage provider gets a 10x on the miner's reward. Um, but I think there will be many changes after some community discussion about what needs to happen on Phil Plus. Okay, 
So the reason I bring this up is FEM deals with this kind of data, the metadata of these storage deals, and it allows developers to bring programmability to this type of information. Um, for example, you might write a smart contract that uh, renews a deal with a specific client. Or, uh, sorry, you might write a smart contract that identifies a certain client and their deal and renews it with a certain provider that you, that you sent. That, that might be an example. Okay, let's see what we got. Okay, uh, we have Filecoin Solidity Library. Uh, again, this allows developers to build uh, in Solidity. And there's smart contracts and then, okay. Zach Ayesh is going to give us a bit of a demo uh, using the Solidity library, but let's see if there's sound. Uh, so uh, we have okay. this concept of storage deals, which has existed since the beginning of Filecoin, and we have uh, the Solidity EVM uh, runtime. How do we connect it to? Uh, well, we work together with uh, a great team of developers at, at a company called Zondax. Uh, to create a file point on Sol or the file point Solidity libraries. And these act as an interface between the traditional file point APIs and those getting those storage deals into your smart contracts in the Solidity world, right? And since I have GitHub open, I'm already open to uh, the page here. And we can come in and click on contracts here under the Zondax uh, file point Solidity. And this is currently in the progress of being moved into the PowerPoint project GitHub. But you'll see a bunch of Solidity files here. Um, these represent what we call uh, inbuilt actors, or you can think of them like Ethereum precompiles if used in the Ethereum world. This is logic that's pre-built in uh, from the old APIs in PowerPoint. And these are the interfaces in Solidity world, right? So I click on Market API. There's a bunch of methods here. Uh, that we can call Solidity to get and set a bunch of different information on deals. I actually have a uh, some code in Remix running right now. Uh, you know, Remix is a very popular IDE for getting started in development in uh, Solidity world. And this is a simple Gitter contract that just imports that market API. You'll see that at the top, and um, calls a bunch of Gitter methods and stores them uh, in. Um, these uh, state variables over here in the top, right? And this is just to show, like, hey, this is how you can quickly get deal information in. Any deal that exists on the follow up blockchain can be retrieved this way. Um, you just provide a deal ID in for each of these methods, and you can write logic around deals, right? Okay, cool. By the way, this computer is on fire right now. Data, uh, data. Okay, let's. Uh, uh. So uh, we have this concept of storage deals, which. Okay. We're gonna watch this over and over again. Uh, this is. Uh, let's see. Ah, here we go. Yeah, but it. Uh, here we go. Okay, sweet. But now let's just. Yeah, okay, perfect. Okay, I don't know if I'm missing a slide between that video and here, but I dare not press back. Uh, we will watch the video again. So we'll just go with this. Uh, okay, now, uh, you have all your tools that you need to build on FEM, uh, Hard Hat, Foundry, MetaMask, etc. You have the Solidity library, so you could write in Solidity these uh, Wasm compiled uh, smart contracts. Uh, now you might say, okay, Robert, how do I know whether or not I need to build with FEM? And on Filecoin, there's basically three paths towards doing uh, storage uh, that I'm going to explain to you right now. So the first is this non-programmatic storage. So this is just data of any size. You just need to upload it to Filecoin, no problem. You just do simple storage with a storage on ramp, uh, and maybe later you'll build uh, some type of uh, app or tool on top of that data that references that data in some way, um, no problem. Just standard Filecoin storage. But let's say you need programmatic storage, some type of uh, business logic on top of your storage deals. Well, there's another question you need to consider. 
how big is the data that is going to be involved with each one of these storage deals. If it's greater than four gigabytes, that's great. Uh, generally speaking, you could just do direct deal making with the deal making starter kit. This is something available on our uh, FEM hackathon cheat sheet. Uh, but more or less, uh, this will use FBM to do your storage deal and it's big enough to where um, you don't need to aggregate it before you build your, 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 your DAP or your tool. Uh, however, if your data, generally speaking, is less than four gigabytes, you might want to consider using an aggregator. Um, one example is Lighthouse. Uh, another example is, uh, well, what was called Filecoin Data Tools. It might have been retired now, but uh, I'll have to check if this is updated. Um, but deal aggregation effectively allows you to include your deal uh, with a bunch of other deals into one bigger deal. Uh, and so generally speaking, this should be more interesting to storage providers to pick up your deal. Okay. Uh, and the use cases, by the way, are many. Uh, I'll talk a little. Ah, okay. I might be missing slides. Uh, but you could think about a number of different use cases. One of my favorites is perpetual storage. So you can write FEM smart contracts. Uh, let's say, okay, so here's the example. You do a storage deal as a client, and you want that data to be with that storage provider or any storage provider for, let's just say, forever. Uh, whatever forever is. Um, you might, instead of every six months at the end of a storage deal, uh, instead of every six months going uh, and manually renewing the deal, you might write a smart contract that you endow with some Filecoin. And let's say uh, that endowment is invested somewhere, uh, just hypothetically speaking. Uh, let's say that investment, you know, let's just say it returns. Uh, I don't know, just hypothetically an average of 8% uh, per year, well, you can write the uh, smart contract logic to then say, okay, if this endowment made more money last year than the storage deal will cost next year, renew the deal. If not, find a new storage provider that will let us uh, do this for cheaper. Uh, and so technically, uh, you can get that, that software to renew the deal in perpetuity forever, uh, because you have this endowment uh, and the uh, FEM smart contract will handle the renewal for you and you never have to do it manually. Uh, another great uh, example is DataDAO, which we'll talk about in a moment. You can have a situation where multiple people are involved in um, managing, let's say, a data set. And uh, let's say there are maybe scientific researchers um, and they've created this data set together. Maybe there's five researchers in the lab. They create a data set together. They want to sell it to third parties. Uh, well, they can write a smart contract that will uh, lock uh, that data. Uh, if a third party <laughs> pays the smart contract, let's say 10 Filecoin, they get to see the data. And then that 10 Filecoin can be dispersed between those, those researchers. Um, FEM, you can also do uh, uh, data access control. So this would be, for example, uh, you have a family photo album stored on Filecoin. Uh, you only want to allow your family members to actually see that data. Well, you can encrypt the data and then uh, set the Filecoin addresses for whom the private key would actually unlock that data. And you could do all of the uh, very interesting use cases that are uh, already known uh, to the crypto world that you could just do with smart contracts. Uh, On-chain voting is a very uh, interesting one. Um, yeah, okay, cool. If you ever take a class with me at a university, you will do a voting uh, use case. So, okay, cool. Uh, this is an example of a data DAO. We call it Biscuit uh, DAO because uh, this is the Filecoin Foundation mascot. It's a corgi named Biscuit. Uh, come to another Phil event, uh, you will get a corgi, like a little plush animal. Uh, sorry, we couldn't ship it here. I know, I'm sorry. Uh, Las Vegas? The Las Vegas one will be limited edition themed like Elvis. So come to Vegas, get a corgi that looks like Elvis. Uh, yeah, it's actually really cool. Uh, 
I don't think we've, we haven't seen the Istanbul one Gary. yet. Yeah. We'll, we'll check with Gary. I can almost guarantee there will be, be one. What was that? What was that? It, it should be cat in Istanbul, bro. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I believe. Uh, uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> what was that? Well, I'm not going to Vegas, so Jenks will have to bring us back uh, some corgis, you know. So, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the good ones was Lisbon last year. We had space. Uh, we had corgis in spacesuits. Anyway, uh, cool. Okay. So, example of a data DAO. Let's say you have a bunch of uh, corgi owners. Uh, they want to manage data related to their corgis because they want to learn more about uh, the health of their corgis. Well, they may have ZK verified uh, contributors to actually access a smart contract. And if they're verified, they can upload data about their corgi. Let's say it's their health data. And with that data, the DAO can then vote on what to do with that information. For example, training an AI model about their corgi behavior or uh, uh, give access to, uh, to the data, give access of the data, give access about the data. I don't know, I don't even know the grammar for this, but uh, give their veterinarian access to the data. Yes, there we go, okay. Uh, they might decide to vote for that. Um, and maybe they can build other cool things with FEM. Uh, for example, the treasury can uh, handle persistent storage you could do uh, renewal, repair, and replication, which maybe we'll get to at the end if we have time. Um, or you might uh, you know, send some of this treasury uh, money to a DEX or some type of uh, cross-chain token bridge to have other services that might support the DAO. And the result is maybe happier, healthier corgis. You know, who knows? Okay. Uh, this is a QR code to our data DAO kit. Uh, we are currently in the middle of the Open Data Hackathon. So this is a remote hackathon that runs from now to September 20th. So that's the deadline to submit. I mean, technically you could start building three days before the deadline. Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, this will get you started with the bare minimum needed for a data down. So take a screenshot, I don't know, uh, open the link. Uh, it's a very good uh, QR code. If it's working. I hope it's working. Okay, good. Cool. 43,000 Yes, uh, there is uh, a lot of money up for grabs in this open data hack. Um, so, you know, it won't be for nothing, I promise. Well, if you win. So <laughs> okay, cool. But I'm judging. Nepotism, I don't know. I met you in Seoul. I like you guys, so, okay. Uh, okay, Lilypad, uh, so, how does FEM and Lilypad interact? First of all, what is Lilypad? I mentioned it earlier, back a lot of Lilypad. Uh, this is an off-chain compute of the data stored on Filecoin. And this is compute over the actual data stored on Filecoin. Where FEM comes into play is you can initiate these jobs from FEM. So for whatever reason, uh, you might have, uh, I don't know, what might an example be? Well, you might have an FEM smart contract that monitors when new data is added uh, to a certain, uh, uh, I don't know, storage provider. Um, and the FEM might say, hey, retrain this, this AI uh, uh, app, more or less, uh, with this new data that's added. Uh, Water Lily is a very interesting uh, uh, app that's been built uh, on top of Filecoin. It's live, it uses FEM, uh, it's generating AI art, and they use FEM also to ensure that some of that revenue actually goes back to the creators on which this AI art is inspired by. Okay, these are some of the really interesting tools that are being, uh, are, are live, are being built for FEM. Uh, you have access controls, network analytics, oracles, containers, all things that will help you understand what's happening on FEM so you can better build on FEM. Okay. Okay, good, we have time. All right, 
This is what the, uh, uh, let's say, diagram is for aggregation. And uh, really, it's kind of self-explanatory. You have a bunch of different clients, maybe they're developers, that uh, want to have their deals aggregated into one larger deal. Uh, well, an aggregator will put that together. There are two options. One is to um, use uh, what we used to call decentralized aggregator, but I think we changed it for the purpose of the docs, uh, where it's software that will do this. Uh, or you can use a centralized aggregator like Lighthouse, which is uh, much more common. But you could imagine uh, what's happening is those deals are being compiled and then proposed to the Filecoin network as one storage deal. Uh, but what's interesting about this is we have something called PODSI, so proof of data, Jenks, uh, uh, is it proof of data segment or sector inclusion? I think it's sector. Okay, <laughs> anyway, proof of data uh, sector inclusion. Okay, Timo, cut this part from the recording. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I should know that. Uh, yes. Okay, good, good. Uh, but this is cryptographic evidence that your data has actually been included in the bucket of uh, segment. Segment. Oh, it was segment. Okay. I thought it was segment, but then I was thinking sector is the file. Segment inclusion. segment inclusion. Yes, exactly. Okay, good. So proof of data segment inclusion. This is cryptographic evidence that your data is actually included in the aggregated deal. Uh, this is a diagram of renewal as a service. Uh, long story short, uh, we kind of want developers uh, to build this, but you could imagine you have some renewal as a service node uh, monitoring the blockchain uh, and then basically determining uh, based on uh, when that deal will, will expire, whether or not something needs to happen, for example, a renewal job or a replication job. And we suspect clients will subscribe to these services uh, to make their life easier about storing deals. Okay. Deal flow on Filecoin. Now, uh, this kind of gets into a little more our difference between aggregators and direct deals. Uh, so, first of all, data size. If you're below four gigabytes, uh, you're using an aggregator. If you're above four gigabytes, usually direct deal making will work. Uh, your retrievability actually, uh, if you're using um, an aggregator, you can actually retrieve that data from the aggregator even before uh, it hits the Filecoin blockchain. Uh, with the four gigabyte direct deal making, you need to wait for it to hit the this Filecoin blockchain. Uh, the flexibility, uh, unfortunately, uh, the deal parameters for aggregators uh, is kind of limited by what the aggregator can handle. Uh, but with direct deal making, you can actually set your own uh, deal parameters. And uh, with respect to what technology you could use, uh, okay, Filecoin data tools, we used to call it estuary. Um, again, we'll clarify whether or not that's been retired. Um, but with direct deal making, we have a client contract for you. You can actually find it on the FEM hackathon cheat sheet. Uh, Robert, you have 15 minutes left, and do you have time for Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, I'll wrap up in maybe three minutes, and then I'll take questions. Cool. So what does the deal flow look like? Uh, well, clients will put fund in escrow with the storage market actor on chain. So this is deal flow using FEM to do Filecoin storage. So step one, a client puts funds in escrow with the storage market actor on chain, actor being a smart contract. The client will upload the car file. Uh, again, the car file is the data type, uh, the, the file type for data that's stored on Filecoin uh, to a web server. So these car files are all CID and IPLD compliant. We talked about that at the beginning. The client sends a storage deal proposal to boost Boost is the software that the storage providers run to pick up deals. Right, you guys run Boost? Yeah, perfect. Um, Boost will check that the client has enough funds in escrow to pay for storing the file. Boost will accept the storage deal proposal and then downloads the car file from the web server, uh, publishes the deal on chain, and the client can check that the deal is successfully published on chain. Uh, this is another aggregation uh, redundant slide, but. Uh, 
Uh, typically, aggregation was happening off-chain all the time, but now a lot of it has moved on-chain. Okay, Matt Hamilton has some great demos that, in the interest of time, we're going to skip. But I will send the slides out, and you can watch uh, yourself. Okay. Oh, okay, sorry, Matt. Okay, and then finally, uh, as we discussed, uh, replication, renewal, and repair uh, as a, as a uh, service. Uh, we think that clients will want uh, some type of RAS uh, uh, to make sure that their deals are healthy, let's say, and are uh, renewed or replicated as needed. And we think uh, some service providers will be able to fill this niche by, by building this. Okay. Uh, I'm going to skip that too. And that. And that also. Okay. This is a uh, QR code, again. Uh, this is all your FEM uh, resources. So I believe the hackathon cheat sheets should be on there, but also a bunch of other amazing links. Uh, if you want to learn more about FEM, I would encourage you to uh, scan that QR code and get all the links on there. Especially if you're coming to build at a hackathon, this will be very, very helpful. OK. Amazing. All right, this is the great team uh, at uh, FEM uh, who have really accomplished a lot. FEM launched in March. Uh, and if you ever see any of them at a hackathon or at a fill event, uh, make sure you say hello. Uh, Sarah runs the uh, FEM DevRel team, so you'll see her and the rest of the team uh, being Matt, Zach, and Longfei at the hackathons, being there ready to uh, help you build on FEM. Okay. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Cool. All right. Uh, happy to take questions, uh, but that's the talk. Thank you. Cool. So, FBM is not applicable for non-A plus deal. Uh. Oh no, it's it. Yeah. It does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any deal. Any deal. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you might write some interesting uh, FEM smart contract that uh, discriminates between a fill plus or a standard deal and does certain, some certain thing based on whether or not it is fill plus or not. Um, so that's something you could do with FEM as an example. So, yeah. Cool. It just so happens most of these deals are fill plus deals. So, you know. Cool. Any other questions? Yes, James. Do you, know, do you have any idea on the Wasm implementation? Yes. Uh, Soon. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I'll have to check uh, for you and get back to you. But yeah, uh, we think native Wasm actors will be a uh, very compelling uh, user created native Wasm actors are going to be very compelling. And the reason for that is you'll be able to do your smart contracts directly on FEM rather than doing it inside the virtualized Ethereum uh, layer. Uh, this might be more efficient for execution. Um, so we're very excited for that. Uh, Can you use, you need to explain what is WASM? Oh, yes. WASM uh, WebAssembly. Uh, so uh, if your language compiles to WebAssembly, you can write smart contracts um, in that language. So I believe the Java family of languages compiled to WebAssembly. I believe the C family of languages well, compiled. Most languages, most languages do, yeah. So you can write your smart contracts in whatever your preferred language is. Uh, yeah. Is there any like, medium article or GitHub source for I can quickly start with FBM? Yeah, yeah. Like, any kind of functionality, like potential storage or yeah. Um, so, like, I want to write a quick, simple function of perpetual storage. Right? Yeah. Well, uh, not sure about perpetual storage, but this is the. Any kind of Android. Uh, uh, oh, what just happened? NFT. This is the DataTow starter kit. So, this will get you building a DataDAO on FEM. 
Uh, but if you go to the hackathon cheat sheet, uh, we have links to get you started with aggregators and direct deal making as well. Uh, so the, what we call the client contract is available on the FEM cheat sheet, which is available from the other QR link. Uh, so you could immediately do that uh, direct deal making contract uh, immediately. Yes. Which should be, should be this QR code. Should be there. Should be there. Yeah, so uh, interesting, interesting thing what about is, this. What is familiarity of ChatGPT Yes, so uh, two comments, by the way. There's an entire repository of smart contracts uh, that you can just take and use as standard. Uh, I'm forgetting, maybe Jinx, you know what this is. Uh, there is a repository of all the popular use cases yes. of the Yes. Uh, they have sample solidity. Yeah. Do you remember what that's what that's called? Uh, uh, FEM uh, event in a box has links to all of them. Perfect. Cool. Yeah. So if you search FEM event in a box, yeah. this is uh, Robert's curation of uh, a lot of resources. Uh, you will find links to, for example, DataDAO examples, and there uh, you can fork or whatever, uh, copy, paste all these, or teach ChatGPT to write it. Yeah. Um, and then you can deploy your own data now. So we, we, you probably have to use the um, chat GPT 4.0, right? Uh, no, 3.5, 3 anything will work. But uh, what we need to do is chat GPT will not natively understand all point for system and our tooling. So you, it's garbage in, garbage out. So you need to feed it with good information first. You, need, you might need to have a good conversation with chat GPT first and teach chat GPT about what PowerPoint is about, whatever Robert just said. Uh, and then you can uh, then show maybe some examples of solidity code that our engineers have written and ask HGP to replicate with th all those knowledge in his head, uh, ask it to generate uh, contracts. So it will be more reliable. Uh, and then uh, what you need to also do to use it in real life is uh, A, testing for the user experience, but B, very importantly, you need to get audited. Um, so yeah, so for, for example, data data, if anyone can hack it, then they have access to valuable data. Right. Um, so yes, that's that's something that we haven't provided yet. And that is audited sample uh, solidity contracts for people to use. Thankfully, uh, because it, it is uh, EVM compatible, so there were a lot of uh, um, yeah yeah. Uh, there's a lot of example projects already <coughs> tested, audited in an Ethereum ecosystem. You can just copy paste and move to FEM. It should be secure enough. Yeah. Something I would just say that I think is very important that Jenks brought up. Uh, is about testing and auditing. Uh, I found when writing software with ChatGPT's help, it can get you like 80% of the way there and give you a lot of really good syntax. Uh, but then it's your responsibility kind of to be the software engineer, the expert on, you know, actually getting it over the finish line to be a working product. So. Uh, I'd say it helps reduce time in figuring out syntax and maybe some interesting, uh, I don't know, how you would structure your code, um, but it will still take that last 20% for you to get it to where it needs to be to, to publish. Um, and I, that's just generally doing software with ChatGPT. Uh, I think that, that that's generally true. Uh, e even if you're just writing uh, like complicated Excel formulas, I find that uh, you know, for example, there's one situation where you would have to, one situation I ran into was actually asking ChatGPT two different things and combining those things because when I asked them together, I couldn't figure it out. Uh, so yeah, it still takes some level of human intervention uh, for sure. So, cool. Any other questions? Uh, sweet. Uh, well, no one likes anyone that goes over time, so maybe uh, I will give some seven minutes back to you. But uh, thank you so much for having me, and it's uh, been a real pleasure. Uh, please come to the open data.